Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of Differential Diagnosis, the House MD podcast where we are differentially diagnosing every single episode of House MD ever 15 years after the fact. Welcome to episode 14 of the podcast. We're going to be differentially diagnosing season one, episode 15, Mob Rules, also known as, Hey, what you say about my brother? Oh, what you calling him? Hey, give me some steak, spaghetti. <laughs> my name is Harvey. And joining me this week as the co-host, and every other week, I don't know why I specifically made it sound like he just turned up this week, is my friend and co-host, Gaz. Oh, pleasure to be here. <laughs> um, but more seriously, yeah, always a pleasure to be here. Um, we're just, this is a great episode, in my opinion, uh, for just so many reasons. Well... I agree. It's got some great drama with the patients. Yeah. Um, it like lets us into the characters, but of course, most importantly, it's Vogler too. Ooh, Vogler part it. two, the two Voglers. Yeah, I two Vogler, two Furious. Is he furious? He is a little bit furious in this. He's quite furious. He he does go. He does do that weird line where he's like, "Did the Doctor House?" And it's like, "What's going on here?" <laughs> I guess like I mean we've already been into the background of this character how he was kind of forced on the writing team and uh, I, I don't know like w watching it back with things like that is always quite funny because you kind of seem like you know they try to make him not dry so th like they throw in these little like quirky bits I think they're trying to sabotage the character like making him seem a little goofy I think they're trying to rectify. <laughs> that being said, though, he does have a really good bit with Cuddy in this episode. Um, where he does. Well, sorry. Go yeah. On. Where he's really trying to get to the essence of the relationship between Cuddy and House. And Cuddy's having none of it, but he is. And then he has a good monologue and well, not a monologue, a dialogue with Cuddy, uh, which ends with him kind of outlining his philosophy uh, regarding the hospital, but also with regards to house, like his his kind of opposition in that respect, his kind of how he's a mirror to house, which I think is really interesting. I think um, I I agree. I I think like we're taking the piss out of Vogler, but I do think that this episode in particular, he um, through his dialogues with Cuddy, he really lays out his. Uh, philosophy and I think it this episode although I don't think Vogler is still the best character <laughs> in no. the show this 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 episode definitely like brings it out this is this is a really good episode in my opinion I I mean you've already said you thought it was a great episode but because it not only characterizes Vogler well it kind of also kind of sums up kind of brings out a lot about Cuddy and House's relationship uh, it's got a lot of uh, funny scenes, but at the same time, it's also got a great patient drama as well. Yeah, and it involves the it involves the fellows in the Vogler. Vogler, sorry, <laughs> Vogler. Uh, no, let's myself. carry on with Vogler. I like it. Fair enough. It involves the fellows in the uh, vodka, sto <laughs> vodka. <laughs> vodka story. Ed in the Vogler storyline, like very neatly, I think things really start to come together, and you start to see the pushing and pulling, and the and the drama and the tension building. Uh, after that introduction um but um so i think i think this week because i noticed in the last episode actually that we actually had an intro that went on for about 12 minutes because we sort of started analyzing the episode in the intro so i'm going to try and avoid that this week that's why i'm sort of shutting it down <laughs> wow only at five minutes 37 seconds or so well it, in the edit it will be different but yeah i'm I'm going to cut out a lot of this, <laughs> but, um, but yes, yeah, so let's, uh, let's go straight into the, uh, the synopsis, Gaz. Well, what's going on in this episode? Obviously we always insist that people, um, watch the episode beforehand to get a clearer idea of what's going on. And also it makes you feel like more involved and then you can give us your comments afterwards. But, um, but yeah, just, just to fill us all in, Gaz, why don't you give us the, uh, why don't you give us the uh, synopsis of uh, Mob's Rule? My pleasure. Um, as you know, the uh, synopsis is powered by, uh, we're not sponsored by, house.fandom.com. 
And uh, so here goes the synopsis. I was going to say, actually, how impressive. We're on episode 14 and we haven't started a Patreon yet. <laughs> wow. We've done very well. Yeah. Venmo me. We're just burning for our cash <laughs> until we get sufficiently popular enough to go on Joe Rogan. And then people will just give us money, right? That's how it works. That is how it works. This would definitely... You can definitely make a living out of this. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Come on, Cass, give us a synopsis. <laughs> um, all right, so Mob Rules is a first season episode of House, which first aired on March 22nd, 2005. A judge orders House to treat a mob informant. House does so under protest, but even when the patient recovers, he figures something is wrong with him and wants to keep treating him. When he butts heads with Vogler over the treatment of the patient, Vogler spends two days fighting with Cuddy over House's continued employment, resulting in Cuddy having to make a terrible compromise in order to keep House at the hospital. Meanwhile, House figures out someone on his team is keeping Vogler, sorry, Vogler <laughs> informed and takes steps to try and confirm who it is. So really interesting we get a little bit of like a who done it apart from just like the usual procedural drama we've got to figure out who's the rat just like the mobster who's ratting out the mafia with his by turning himself in oh damn i didn't even see Ooh. that yeah there's hey the the storylines are connected and um and while the medicine isn't like thematically connected, like it sometimes is, the medicine uh, definitely comes out in order to <clears throat> perpetuate the patient drama. So um, not really a spoiler, but to confirm how we think, I, I think we both agree that this is a pretty strong episode. Yeah. Um, on all on all grounds. So uh, hey, let's let's get into why we think that this is. Uh, Season 1, episode 15, Mob Rule. Zzz. eating some steak so i did a bit of research before this my first load of research and um found out that this episode was not only written by a guy called john krasinski i think that's how you pronounce his name who has done some quite good episodes but this is made by our very very good friend david foster who is the only other writer that we've ever praised he was uh the head writer and um uh like what's the word he was the kind of medical consultant for dnr yeah he was he was and do you know what i found out that he not only did this he's done several episodes but he's also done um broken house's head wilson's heart like all of the big classics he's been involved in like all of the really strong medical dramas so um yeah he's uh for a medical consultant he's um certainly good at picking uh, medical conditions which exacerbate drama and then capitalizing on that yeah um, just thought I'd give him a shout out because we don't often talk about the writers but David Foster really stood out to me at least I was like oh, this is a particularly strong episode I wonder who wrote this and it turns out that it's from someone who wrote a another particularly strong episode yeah um, and being a physician as well I mean he was the consultant right yes and then basically became part of the writing team which is just like that's great hmm. um but yeah uh it seems like that there's a correlation does that mean causation who knows <laughs> so here we have um in in this cold open i really like when the cold opens are more um i don't want to say high concepts but when it's more interesting than just a family just in a house and one of them's ill 
uh, the show slowly gets more interesting with these, but mob mob rules is one of a um one of the rare early ones where they sort of step outside the box a bit. Curse did it as well with that weird kind of Ouija scene. Yeah. Um but yeah, the fact that this one is set during a um, you know, witness protection uh program where one of the, uh, a member of the mob is gonna testify and uh he is uh he's being represented by his lawyer, who's also his brother. And um yeah, the the, the sort of scene starts while they're in a witness protection safe house. And um He's eating steak, he gets up, and then he collapses. And so you have this kind of, um, like loads of things already in, uh, loads of things in order. Like we immediately establish why House has to take the case because he's forced to by a court, which is a nice twist on why House has taken the case. He's not interested in it. He's just forced to. And um, And then on top of that, we have like, you know, obviously there's all this drama with the brother. There's the tension that obviously as soon as he gets out, he's going to be, have to go into witness protection and um and then there's like the inherent danger of being in witness protection like it just that simple setup like sets up a lot of drama right off the bat and uh, on top of that it's also quite a high concept intro so i quite um i I like it i rate it yeah um what i like about it is that it goes from that kind of patient opener straight into the what might be the central arc of this part of the season the season which is between Cuddy Vogler and House where Vogler is just pressuring for revenue statements metrics you know whatever can be shown to be of quantifiable worth for House's you know, profession as a medic. Um, And then House just barges in, says he's being kind of antagonised by the Justice Department to do this case, and uh, Vogler seems to get a rise out of seeing House having to do something outside of his usual comfort zone. Yeah, especially Um, something that he's forced to do. Because we've established that Vogue is a very controlling man. So I think there's always an element of when somebody is forced to do something that they don't want to do because they have to. Like, I think Vogler kind of gets off on that. Yeah. He gets a rise out of trying to control, well, not necessarily um, controlling the situation, but seeing other people being controlled by situations that he's not being controlled by. You know, it's not like the Justice Department are forcing him to do it. They're forcing House to do it. And because House is someone who thinks he's he doesn't need to be controlled or compelled in that way, that he gets to choose his cases. Yeah. It, exactly. it gives Vogler what he wants, which is seeing House powerless against authority. Yeah. And it, it's quite interesting that you um that you noticed initially that like Vogler's there looking for metrics and numbers because obviously house isn't i mean we've already talked about how house's house's values are quite difficult to define but it's sort of more anarchic it's like you know really value based yeah Uh, but uh but like vogler wants to run the hospital like a business and everything's very everything's very numbers based so it's him and cuddy literally going through spreadsheets and like tax documents just like seeing what is the numerical value of house yeah and it, it's quite interesting as well because vogler is initially setting up this aspect of um you know if you can prove to me that house has value outside of like him being a doctor or him being a friend to cuddy then he might keep him but we yeah. that 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 is kind of unveiled later uh yeah. over the over the vogler arc it's quite nice that vogler Kind of at first, you think that he's kind of a, you know, a sort of down the line businessman, like as long as the numbers show something's good, that he will rationally come to the decision that it's good. But uh, that control element slowly comes in and you start to see that actually like Vogler is governed by other things, other needs. Like yeah. even if House was worth billions to the hospital, Vogler would maybe still want to get rid of him because he just does not listen. But um, but this this episode starts to bring in that like 
I mean, even though control kind of touched on this, this element, this episode like definitely expands on that. Like House is literally being forced to take the case. And there's lots of other requirements that Vogler starts putting on him in order to sort of exacerbate this control that he wants, which I've, is yeah. like Vogler tries to present it like it's rational, like, oh, everything needs to run like a well-oiled machine. But it starts to become like quite irrational in a way. And I think that that, that lends an extra element to the character that he's not, you know, quite well, as... The high, po- the high point of this episode, apart from the patient drama, which I think there are several poignant points in that patient drama. Yeah, absolutely. Is, um, Vogler basically saying, you know, the metaphors of a well-oiled machine or whatever, those metaphors are crap. It's a business. And house is bad for business. Mm. Which he, we've seen, he, you see, I think he's speaking out of two both sides of his mouth because, yeah, he does see it like that. But he only, he applies that principle only when it's favourable to him to undermine House. Yeah. Like you say, if House was worth like a billion dollars a year to the hospital, he would find a way to undermine that by saying he's not productive enough or he's not good enough. Maybe we can get someone else in. Yeah. I mean, Vogler even says, like, we're not leaving this room until he's gone. Yeah. Like, Vogler isn't saying, like, oh, yeah, because him and... So the idea with uh, Cuddy and Vogler is that they are literally sitting in Cuddy's office, running through everything. That's kind of how they spend the entire episode. And Vogler has already pretty much come up with the idea that he'd lose. He wants to get rid of House. Yeah. So, um, yeah, as you say, like, there's this... um, Yeah, there's this idea that Vogler's already made up his decision and it's not entirely based on the good of the business, even though that's what he preaches. Yeah. And I think the other thing to use, a really good metaphor for understanding the kind of dynamic that's going on at the moment is it's like a trial. It, at the moment, <laughs> yeah. Vogler, Vogler is um, the prosecution. He's charged House with being redundant, um, unproductive, a nuisance controlling, undermining the authority of a public institution. <laughs> and Cuddy's like, well, she's the defense. And she's saying, well, no, he's good. He does his job. He gets results. He, he might be dealing with very niche things that don't have broader societal impact, but he actually brings something to the hospital. Yeah. Solves people's problems. Hmm. But... The problem with the dynamic that's really interesting, and I do really subscribe to this trial metaphor for understanding what's going on in that those scenes, is that the judge is also Vogler. Yeah. But it's also the audience as well. The audience has to make a decision whether House is someone who's ultimately worthy of practicing medicine. Mm. But Vogler is also the person... But in the actual story, he, Vogler is the actual person who um, is the judge, kind of. But maybe not. Maybe the ultimate test for House is whether his fellows are on the side. But we'll see. Maybe they are the ultimate judge of his character. <laughs> we'll see. Well, they'll definitely go a long way to trying to um, manipulate things. <laughs> yeah. But Let's I'm very that. much of the opinion when they're in that... Oh, God, he's just in the d- d- Dr. House in the house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what are the most weird lines ever written? Just to make Vogler seem goofy and relatable, kind of, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, one, the one thing <clears throat> on this idea of, like, they're having a trial, uh, like, in sort of Cuddy's his defense... The the one thing I really like about House's character is that, and I only really noticed it while watching it, is just this, that he never really actually interacts with Cuddy or says thank you. Like, this kind of, I, I think in a lot of other shows, like, either this discussion would be happening in secret and House would find about it later. Yeah. Find out about it later and be like, you know, just be like, oh my God, like, it would be a twist, like House would keep his job. And he'd find out it was Cuddy who defended him. And he'd be like, oh, my God, thank you so much. 
or like he'd be trying to defend himself but defending himself but i really like the idea that house is just like doing the regular episode stuff well, two people are having an argument about whether or not he should stay, and he had no, and he's completely aware of this. Yeah. He becomes very aware of the situation, and he never like thanks anyone. And it's like, uh, I mean, obviously, exp- uh, you're never really sure, but it's like you don't know if whether or not he just doesn't care, or it's just a pride uh, thing. But it's just absolutely fascinating that that kind of like a lot of other shows would go for that drama, where it's like an emotional, like, oh my god, Cuddy, I can't believe you did this for me. But uh, the show never capitalizes on it. It like yeah. completely just shows that House does not care. And I've no. always found that very funny. He becomes the exhibit to his own trial. Yeah, exactly. He just bounces in and out of this like discussion about whether there is more to medicine than just whatever the kind of numeric output is. You know, the utilitarianism versus the kind of value-based arguments and he just kind of bounces and says i don't care about any of this (laughs) and also i don't care about you (laughs) to like cuddy he's like i'm trying to defend you it's like no still don't care about you (laughs) um so um well that yeah so that's kind of the the power struggle of vogler and house then i think um but there's there's a lot of other things going on in this episode there's uh what is popularly known as hammerin <laughs> <laughs> which doesn't sound quite as good as huddy had you ever heard the acronym hammerin yes i have it's yeah. quite disturbing i mean i don't what's the other one Kaus. yeah Kaus. hammerin's better Kaus but, um... is like a welsh soup no that's <laughs> cowl Kaus is cheese in welsh oh fair enough so well, we um well, we start we start to go into, I mean, there's a lot going on in this episode. The, the, I I feel like the most recent episodes have started to branch out a lot more in how many subplots they can juggle. Yeah, but I don't I don't think that these subplots are like being handled badly. I think the show is now starting to has its main plot, and then it's got like the secondary drama. You know, so it's got the patient drama, then it's got the secondary hospital drama, then it's usually got like a clinic scene. But it's starting to have these little extra threads, yes. which are like two minutes of the episode, maybe. And then they sort of become the larger plots later on. It's definitely getting better at setting stuff up, yeah. which aren't just like throwaway hints. It's more sort of more sort of like small moments, which are then expanded naturally and organically into plot lines later. Um, yeah. Uh, the, I agree, the... and they're also threaded in really well, so mm. that, for instance, you get, all right, you get the opening scene, then you get uh, the Vogler scene, and then you get the Cameron liking house, or Hammerin scene, as you put it, and then it kind of rotates around, it threads around, it, the writing has gotten good that it can just easily select one thread, pull it out, discuss it, and then put it back into the whole central like plot yeah it's definitely like have you ever heard the um have you ever heard the uh kind of observation that people's first films like independent films from first film directors are always really frustrating because the scenes that they shoot last are always better than the scenes that they shoot first because they get better at it as they go along yeah which is why a lot of independent films are, are quite weird yeah and consistent. unbalanced and this kind of has the writing equivalent of that. Like, uh, I, I think it's more than just, um, I think like pilots are obviously difficult. And I think the house pilot like has less going on for that reason, because like they have to establish everything. So they want to like really focus on some things. But I genuinely think that you can see, yeah, like you can literally see the scripts getting better. Yeah. As it goes on. And it's really interesting to watch. Um, I mean, once they nail the formula down, you don't really see that as much. Like house episodes are kind of good or bad, seemingly just based on who's working on them. But because they have such a tight knit writing crew for the first season, like you can just see the team collectively getting better. And um, the the, the way they're inter- introducing like subplots and like writing the stories is a pretty good indicator of that. Yeah. So, for instance, the one of the main one of the main 
cl- well, the clinic plot is basically a kid who has stuff stuck up his nose and who creates a narrative through sticking stuff up his nose in order you, to... You might have to go into a bit more detail on that one. <laughs> Whoops, that might sound a bit crazy. Right, so a baby's... Uh, a brother has um, brought in a child, uh, his brother... All right, let me just redo this. <laughs> a teenager or some sort of college-aged person has brought in his younger brother, who's a toddler, who he's babysitting, uh, who has a massive complaint. Um, Definitely a mistake, baby. Yeah. Um whatever you say um and i mean parents don't just decide to expand the family 17 years later hey stranger things have happened i'm very much uh i know that you subscribe to the everybody lies mantra in life <laughs> as in fiction but yeah um so basically um house identifies that uh, the baby is the toddler is putting um, toys up its nose and they happen to be in a particular order and this order is like a story because he's got something else stuck up his nose a cat and basically he's sending the fireman and the police officer to try and save the cat that's stuck up his nose um, and that's really smart and it yeah, also I mean... becomes a bridge between understanding the um the brother of the mobsters uh motivations but also his skills which are are to make people think he's going to hurt them in order to get them to do what he wants them to do yeah um very similar to vogler i guess yeah but hurt financially (laughs) (laughs) well vogler's legit that's what foreman says that's the difference yeah well, he, um, well, yeah, as you say, like that's uh, like kind kind of mildly tied to the episode, but just um, yeah, the 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 clinic skits are just. I mean, it's a really nice little narrative. It actually does. Um, I believe it does inspire a eureka moment for House. Um, uh, later on, but yeah, that little like small narrative within a narrative within a narrative. Yeah, just the way that they're sort of getting better at threading those plots is like definitely there. Um, yeah, should we talk about the patient drama? I mean, the patient drama kind of interacts with a lot of other <laughs> elements of this, so maybe that's like the core of what we should talk about. Okay. Um, I I, I don't I don't mind if you do, but I I like if you want to go on to talking about it <laughs> because um. Yeah, like there's a lot to unpack here, I think. Okay. It kind of feels like um you you earlier compared it to Fidelity. Yeah. A lot, which I liked. So I will let you go into that. So the central at the kind of climax of the patient drama is house breaking it to um uh the patient that well, the patient's brother that this guy has a condition but it means that you have to accept an uncomfortable truth in order for that condition to be healed which is that his brother is gay um and we'll get into the mechanics of diagnosis later on but he had to accept that truth in order for him for his brother to get well but it also meant also accepting that um, he had to go into witness protection in order to become himself, that he had to lose his brother to do that and yeah. had to accept that decision. But it's, to... a very, it's, a much, it's a much more positive spin. It's weird because it's more yeah. positive than Fidelity because uh, in Fidelity, when, when they find out the twist, the husband sort of, you know, calls her bluff and then she is cured because she did have the affair, but then he leaves. And in this one, there's the same kind of thing. He, he, you know, he kind of accepts that maybe the worst case scenario in his mind 
um, is true. And then his brother does get better, confirming that. But um, yeah, it's it's a more positive. Um, it's a more positive outcome. The, the because, mechanic is the same. It's just I yeah, think it, the precisely. outcome is mirrored. Oh yeah, it's a it's a great observation. I, I I like. I thought it was just interesting, but I really enjoyed the way that you identified that it was pretty much the same mechanic. But it um, but they don't go down the same road. They don't have the brother lawyer just going, just saying, "Oh, you're a you're a gay. I can't talk to you now." It kind of actually then instigates a character change in him. Because a lot of the drama from the whole episode is that all all the like diagnoses identify or point to the fact that he has been taking uh, hormone treatments, which are primarily used for gay men, and his lawyer brother sort of ah, not hormone treatments. Oh, sorry, uh, uh, using a aphrodisiac off uh, the internet from China. Yes, that has a lot of estrogen in it which um, kind of points to or at least confirms some of the presuppositions that had been made in the earlier diagnoses. So the pathway for the diagnoses, I'll use this as a way to go into it, mm. is that he comes in, he's in a coma, uh, the patient's in a coma, he comes out of the coma, he goes in, um, and they kind of get to the point where they see it's hep hepatitis C and then the lawyer brother goes that can't be so um it can't be that there's then this idea that his brother may have been raped in jail and that kind of throws us off the scent a little bit about what the central issue is yeah. for the brother because we because it's like okay maybe it's that maybe it's the harsh realities of being incarcerated yeah, um, but that's then, kind of that's always poised as like an alternative that no one really believes. Yeah, it's like a fudge. It's what a lot of the kind of lawyer brothers um, like outlook depends on. It's like he is just finding every excuse to not accept that his brother is gay, yeah. even when it's blindingly obvious. Yeah. And then the second one is a, another kind of a, a real effect, but still a little bit of a red her herring as to the central moral of the story. Um, basically, um, he goes back into a coma. He's still really, really sick. Um, and they basically see that he's a smoker and he's trying to quit smoking. So he's using Chinese um, medicine as a means to um, quit. But the, the medicine has toxins in it and the toxins are really messing him up. And they can't treat the hep C, which uses interferon, while also he's on this um, treatment. So, well, while he's been taking this stuff, so it's like, uh, as House says, the interferon plus this toxin, it's like a match to a, f like a flame to gas. It just explodes, makes the condition even worse. Um, and then we get to the point where um, if I remember correctly, um, they find that he has high levels of estrogen and they're trying to figure that out too. Um, and that leads to the conclusion that he's, he, he's homosexual and then to that moment of truth uh. where the brother has to accept him for who he is. It's great. Uh, but on, on top of that, because, because the brother's in... So the, the main patient is in witness protection as well, which the brother is his lawyer, but the brother doesn't want him to go into witness protection because, um, it, it, you know, for numerous reasons, it's like that it's dangerous, uh, you know, that he'll be screwing people over. But but in a lot of ways, it's mostly because he doesn't want to lose his brother. Yes. He doesn't want to never see him again, which um, even though the patient... I wouldn't. Uh, uh, it's quite interesting because we mostly follow the patient's brother, um, because I guess because he has the most hang-ups on the situation. the The main patient wants to go into witness protection, and a lot of the narrative is even though we're doing, you know, they're doing a medical diag a differential diagnosis on him, like asking, like, oh, what's affecting him? They via that actually diagnose 
the reasons why he wants to go into witness protection, which is that, you know, he has a vested interest. He's a gay man in the mob who yeah. don't traditionally accept gay men. And so it's only when the brother like kind of learns that aspect of it through the medical diagnosis that he then it's quite interesting at the end because he denies that his brother is gay still but he then changes his mind on him going into witness protection he then says to his brother oh you should testify and go into witness protection it's it's a really it's a really cleverly set up thing because not only does the witness protection thing keep you know create a lot of drama because the brother doesn't want anyone to cure him the brother effectively wants to keep him in the hospital so that he can't testify and because then he's in the hospital for so long they then end up actually diagnosing the you know the estrogen issue and therefore that he's a homosexual and therefore his reasons for why he might want to go into witness protection and then like but that's a really nice setup because the brother at the end you have this very bittersweet ending where it's slightly like fidelity because he he kind of denies the patient some some joy in a way. Like in the same way in Fidelity, like she had an affair. Obviously, she wakes up from the treatment and she wants to fix the marriage and he denies her that. You kind of get that because he denies that he's a homosexual. He says, I don't believe it. But then on the other hand, the brother also says, you should testify and could go into witness protection because he knows that he wants to go into witness protection to sort of actually live free as a yeah. gay man. Yeah. And um yeah, it's a really it's a really like well constructed like way for the kind of the brother to accept it but not accept it at the same time. But to tell the audience that he's accepted in a cryptic way because it's so it's a really interesting like character that he can like he can know the truth but deny it. Yeah. But but because he loves his brother so much he can there's, there's, a, there's a lot going on. I think it's in the same, like it really, I think in, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about, sorry, that was a bit of a like <laughs> basic reading of the plot, Yeah, but it's That's really fine. the kind of like pathways that his mind goes down and, you know, but, but the way that the story is constructed and the way that the, like, you know, uh, the circumstances are constructed, you totally like know what the brother's thinking. Yeah. Like it, it's never, it's not ambiguous, which I think is really clever. It's not like at the end of it, you don't go, oh, did the brother accept that he was gay? Because of the way that it's constructed with the witness protection element, by letting his brother go into witness protection, you also know that while he's not accepting his gay, he is accepting he's gay as well. Yeah. And, but it's sort of, uh, yeah. So as I was saying, we, we've talked before about like you, house has inconsistent characters and it has characters believing two things at the same time, which... Yeah might be annoying for some but is actually quite realistic and i think like that is the perfect demonstration of it like but that really yeah yeah that really like seals it and I, i'm not saying it's like you know i mean it's not it's not stunning to write conflicted characters but like that is like a perfect like narrative of how to write a conflicted character yeah uh, like for a, a patient drama that we never see again we never see those characters again and yet we get a great insight into that guy's mind and we get that he doesn't like homosexuals but he loves his brother and we kind of have a complete arc there like in terms of like patient drama writing and it's not even the patient <laughs> it's like the patient's brother like that is like that's brilliant and and then it like you know it obviously like ties into a lot of other things about like you know Vogler and House's uh you know sort of control that they're going after because the brother is also intervening in the situation to keep his brother in hospital the patient in hospital but like yeah there's a lot going on there and it's like insanely well done for the time span that they have to do it in while yeah. like you know you're learning about Hammer and <laughs> and the clinic and Cuddy and Vogler having an argument in a room like yeah, just stunning. Sorry, I went on a bit of a a gush there. Well, this is there. There are a few things to unpack. There are a few things to unpack here. Yeah. Um, firstly, the the main patient drama is one where 
it straddles the the way that they talk to each other, the way that the brother and the patient talk to each other is in like terms of plausible deniability. <laughs> yeah. But it's it's yeah. strad it's straddling it straddles two things. It straddles plausible deniability and affirmation of something. Mm. So it's they talk in these coded ways as if to say, yeah, you know, if anyone asks me, I don't ever have to say. Mm. But I know what you're saying. Yeah, it's fascinating. I really like that you've like properly plausible deniability is the perfect way of like pointing it out. It's like two people that I guess because of their careers have gotten so used to lying about things. They're like having a conversation, but not having a conversation. It's fascinating to watch. They're not lying. They're always talking in terms of subtext. That was why in when the the brother goes into the clinic case and he says, stop. It was never about what the word, the word he said. It was about the subtext of what he was saying. That's the key to understanding this patient relationship. It's the plausible, but, Plausible deniability is just the text. The subtext is everything in this episode. Yeah. It's everything because you are reading between the lines of what they're saying, which is, you know, they were saying you were this way. And it's like, well, yeah, they can say that dot, 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 <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, and then it, it then it goes into that kind of sweet thing of saying look i just want you to do what you want to do hmm. and it's okay if you want to do that this is the best yeah. way to do it completely but this and yet and yet always it's great that you're like you know you go and do that and we both know the reason why you're doing it but let's reframe it as if you're doing it for another reason text subtext it's like a really good way of show of thinking about that and the other thing is is that the clinic case does connect up to the main narrative because it's a parallel it's a bit like a mirror and a parallel at the same time so the older brother looking after younger brother whereas in the in the patient drama it's the younger brother looking after the older brother um and in the terms of the child the child's going through all of this pain hmm. and they keep pulling out this story they don't no one knows it really they're just pulling out this story about who what he this child is doing you know he's sending we find out that he's sending you know the fire truck and the uh toys up the nose to rescue the cat but in pulling it out you find the truth and the story of the what the kid is doing yeah i think and in the same even... way that's what is happening in this episode for the patient it's a slow extraction of the truth for the younger brother about his older brother. There are even three stages, like yeah, you you have like what the the fireman, the police officer, and that to the cat, and in this you have the like Hep the high the like the high estrogen, the gum to the to Hep the aphrodisiac to the red meat. It's like almost the same number of steps to get to the truth. That's yeah. really interesting. It's yeah, it's a very very sophisticated way of summarize or at least um, repeating the story. Um, but yeah, it the parallels between those two stories are quite sophisticated, like how they're drawn out. Mm. It's very sophisticated. Completely. And um, then and then we have from there we have like the early chess pieces being laid in the Vogler House battle. Like, uh, House becomes quite aware early on that someone is leaking information to Vogler. And so he sort of starts sowing the seeds of doubt. He just takes Foreman off the case, um, which is quite funny that Foreman is like being taken off cases and ignored now, given that we had such an intense Foreman <laughs> <laughs> period in the early seasons. It's kind of like we got our wish, but I don't really want it because I yeah. actually would like Foreman to be involved a bit now. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, it's like Foreman is getting punished for his well, early kind well, of spotlight. Well, he's being used as a pawn to make everybody else think that something's wrong. That yeah. He, they've been caught, that they're off the boil. Like, they're not that being caught, that they haven't been caught. Exactly. So. Um, yeah, because he knows that, like, he doesn't think it's Foreman. 
but he takes Foreman off the case to make people think that Foreman is the rat. Mm. And um, I think it's... Um, yeah, there's there's this extra setup as well that we we don't know who the rat is yet, who's uh, the informant. But we have... Um, we can probably assume it's not Cameron because she actually, like, tells House that she has feelings for him and she's attracted yeah. to him. So we know clearly there's something going on there. So we know it's either probably Foreman or... Uh, Classic. Or Chase. Classic and what... rat behavior. Oh, I love you so much. And then <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Shiv them. Plausible deniability. Oh, yeah. But we have... Um... But yeah, with... with um... But we, we have this thing with Chase uh, because... Chase is the interesting one because Chase last episode he was kind of um uh some something happened to Chase. Oh yeah, so Chase was taken off a case for making a mistake. It created some resentment to House. Yeah. We know that Chase then found the drugs which House had been lying about for the heart transplant patient and we then know Vogler received those drugs and then learned that House had been lying about the patient in order to get the heart transplant uh through. So we know that Chase is probably guilty, but then we also have here that kind of how sets up Chase, like Chase really wants to do something with the patient in order to cure him. And how says, yeah, absolutely go ahead. And then um, Chase actually goes to go and cure the patient. Obviously the lawyer brother slaps him and is like, don't you dare do that because we, you know, we already know that house knows that the brother has already threatened house to keep him in the hospital. Yeah. So house kind of pushes Chase into a trap. And so it's this continuing, like, small little slights against Chase, which even though Chase, like, has wanted to emulate House before, you can kind of, you're slowly starting to see how Chase might start resenting House. And I really like the way that's set up. It's not like one big moment, uh, because that doesn't really happen in real life, where one yeah. big moment happens and you go, oh, I hate this person now. Like, some sort of loyalty already resides, but, like, Chase is slowly getting more frustrated at the way he's being treated by House. And, um... It almost feels in a way that House is doing that on purpose. I'm not entirely sure why, but House is a very self-destructive person. <laughs> so, um, I mean, House probably already has conf probably knows that it might be Chase. And then the fact that he's punishing him more. It's a very weird... Um, yeah, it's a very weird mix of, like, things and emotions. Um, I like the way it's being set up, but, like, House punishing Chase is extremely strange. I guess maybe he's getting a sick thrill from it. Like, he's like, oh, I wonder how much I can screw over Chase before he fucks me over. <laughs> Do you think it is, like, really self-destructive or is it part of trying to put pressure on... Because what's interesting about this um, whole episode is that he starts employing kind of mafioso tactics to try and root out the rat. And one way of doing that is to put pressure on people until they crack. Oh, I see what you mean. No, that's pretty interesting. So, yeah, maybe, maybe he isn't as confident that Chase is the rat yet. I, I don't know what he thinks. We don't know what he thinks. But when you think about kind of when a rat is being found out, um, that um, they, kind of, they kind of crumple under pressure. Especially when their judgment is being, or faith or loyalty is being challenged. And I don't know if he's using that same kind of tactic. It's the same thing as um, trying to deceive people into thinking that the problem has gone away so that people will then act more relaxed. So the reason he takes Foreman off the case is to make people think that the entire issue is resolved, that they can then go on with their jolly lives or continue deceiving House. Yeah. No, that's quite. That's an interesting spin on it, and it yeah. certainly fits thematically. <laughs> I I just think that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to put pressure on, but also relieve pressure to see how people react under different stimuli. Yeah. To... No, I I was definitely going down the route of House is just being like <laughs> kind of arrogant and self destructive, which I guess is just the way I perceive the character now. But but, but I think might, that's that true might too. be a more. Oh, that might be a more later season element to him. I no, I think that's true too. He does like to make people squirm. Um, and the thing is, we don't know what House is really thinking about this. Mm. So, and and it also doesn't mean that he won't act in anarchic ways to try and see 
these things through. It's like a mixture of both. It's not... Because he is jeopardising things if he is putting pressure on people who haven't done anything wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> you're right in that sense. You know, it is really odd and self-destructive. There must be more efficient ways to find out. Well, maybe just sitting in a room and shouting at Cuddy for two days. Well, yeah, of course. That is way better way to find out information. <laughs> yeah, and pouring over accounts and going, <laughs> did the doctor house in the house? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> which which is going to be my immortal line um, when I think of Vogler. We we should have called the podcast that. Did the doctor house in the house? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well uh i don't well, know I think... how that would fit on like the title image for our podcast <laughs> hello and welcome to the doctor house in the house oh my god we'll I bet be somebody will do that at some point the doctoring i don't know how you would do like the differential differentially diagnosing an episode it just wouldn't fit with the whole spiel well like, the whole sale well we could uh we could summarize our da -da 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 differential diagnosis <laughs> of uh, of mob rules um F -f -f fantastic a... yeah be I, d I couldn't even finish the sentence you're already you know sort of uh praising it sorry i think that says a lot about the episode no 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 sorry i wasn't i wasn't criticizing that was um it's just it's a big indictment of how good of an episode it is it's in, it's um, it's it, cuz it's, it's one of it's one of those ones Sorry, I guess go. I was endorsing it. I wasn't indicting it. I wasn't like serving it criminal charges. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I just sorry. I'm not being. I'm being a pedant. <laughs> I just don't want you to say something that I know what you mean. But uh, yeah, I mean, it shows shows how much you're you're endorsing it. Um. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. I think it's. I mean, we've the way we've we've been talking about it yet again. We rush rush through that we always do with the ones we like um yeah just uh really stands out on the strength of its i i think like the multiple narratives that it's spinning um is really good but mostly just the just just the patient drama is great i mean it's really top notch like if every episode had that good level of patient drama it would be uh amazing and um and the vogler storyline even though <clears throat> i think I would like to think regardless of what problems you have with it, like I think the Vogler storyline becomes a bit more interesting, especially with the element of that Vogler is now to ex exist exact <clears throat> to exhibit control over house is now pushes that, that element of house must fire someone in the team. And yeah. that's, that's how the episode ends with that. Like, do you think, cliffhanger. do you think that's like a insane, um, cliffhanger oh it's like, a cliffhanger that's that's a, and it's a great cliffhanger like after after an episode like that i mean you have an episode like that you have this kind of vogler storyline going on which is slowly building the kind of the plays are being made and then you have this big cliffhanger with somebody's going to get fired fantastic do you I mean, like we, that hmm? do you like that i didn't know if it was a little bit cliche like no i i have got to choose I mean the way the way they resolve it is I mean the way they resolve it um I mean we'll 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 certainly talk about next week but it's um I mean it's it's kind of a very fairy tale ending in which house wins and the crew the cast stay on because obviously they're not going to get rid of a cast member because the chemistry is just getting started everything's kind of working but um but hey, I I always like a good cliffhanger. Okay, keeps you intrigued. I mean, I I, <clears throat> I think a a lot of it is less. You know, is House going to win? Which at this point, I think it's fairly obvious that House is going to beat Vogler. But it's more House. It, how is House going to go about it? Because I think yeah, what this show has on its uh, side is characters who have an interesting way of problem solving, who are very strategic. And especially when you put House and Vogler together, and Vogler's very like, I think Vogler's kind of, as you say, he's not like he's not like the Moriarty character. I'm glad they didn't do that as well, 
but he's very, you know, he's got a different way of thinking to House. And I think that the way that these two are going to go about trying to outsmart each other is the interesting part of the puzzle, okay. not necessarily the outcome. Um, yeah. Which is kind of like the whole show, right? It's like the end. I mean, in this show, obviously, in this ending, like the actual diagnosis wasn't interesting. It was the way they got there and the consequences along the way. And that's kind of, you know, why I think a cliffhanger does work. I think it's like, oh, I want to see how House resolves this situation, even though I know how he's going to resolve it. So I, I think a cliffhanger is not trite or anything. I think it's perfectly, like, I think it's a perfectly, like, good way to end an episode. Uh, yeah. I I'd certainly I don't mind cliffhangers as long as they actually answer them. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah um, it's not like a lost season one cliffhanger where I have to wait a year. Like, I've only got to wait a week. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I would say the strength of this episode was, in essence, how it was able to thread lots of different stories together and, in fact, bring them all together in it and then hold them all together in a coherent theme. Yeah. Um, but you, you got to admit that patient drama, like, really, like, if you'd have had a lot of, a lot of threads going on without that core patient drama, like... It certainly wouldn't have been as memorable. I think that really makes it a memorable episode. Yeah. It's certainly it's certainly no liar's fest when everyone was lying to each <laughs> other forever. But yeah. Like that's the That's not the gold standard. That's the opposite of the gold sa- standard of how to do that. It's yeah, I can overkill. see how sports medicine and paper was really interesting. It's like let's have everyone lying, but it's like the, uh, the like everyone is kind of lying and strategizing, but it's done in a more interesting way. It's quite it's, hard to vocalize it's, without it's, voice, it's without a, watching. Sport, sports medicine was operating on a kind of sledgehammer approach where it's like, everyone's lying. Here we go. Let's explore this crazy outcome. There's no subtlety. Um, I agree. Yeah, no subtlety to it. Whereas this, it was like, okay, how do we kind of broach the subject of um, someone holding a secret within them and trying to get it out of them without destroying who they are yeah and it's quite interesting in this one because he's lying by omission more than anything i think the problem with sports medicine was that hank uh the patient hank was like just actively just saying no 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 and denying uh whereas this character was um he was being honest at points, like he was ha- he was on the verge of admitting at every point, but he he did just didn't want to do it because it would upset his brother. So we already know the truth. It's more watching another character come to terms with the truth, yeah, rather than learning the truth, which is more dramatic. And, um, and because we'll... it's less of a mystery, it's more of actual drama. Like yeah. the the interest comes from the drama rather than the characters rather than the plot. Which I think is a mistake that a lot of shows make is they just have lots of plot without characters actually yeah. doing anything or growing. And actually, actually, the threat of the episode was not so much that the patient was going to die. It was the threat that the secret was never going to be discussed at all. Yeah, like that, that would be was, the worst outcome. That was the threat throughout. It's like all these different diagnoses were coming in that were saying that actually it was nothing to do with the the patient's lifestyle or whatever he had going on in his life and why he wanted to be in the witness protection the threat was that that was not going to be answered because actually all he needed to do was not eat red meat or <laughs> yeah. stop using this crazy smoking anti-smoking medication you know this quitting medication you know that was the threat and how they broached that in the writing was really really good because you'd think the threat would be that the diagnosis was going to be traumatic and terrible and it would be life-changing and he'd never get over it or he'd die usually that's the threat but in this actually it was the threat that we'd never get to disclose the truth and it kind of links into what house is all about in the sense of the character the threat to him yeah, it's about not allowing his patients to die, but it's also about getting to the truth. 
you know, that's a threat to him not getting to the truth. Be be that truth, like, not, not even the fact that the brother's homosexual, it was more that his his lawyer brother, like, couldn't understand why he wanted to go into witness protection and the homosexuality, like, answered that for him. Mm. In a way, it was more like, yeah, because if they hadn't discussed that, he would have gone into witness protection and the brother would have never have known why he wanted to do it, whereas yeah. now he can and he can have some closure. Well, he was actively trying to change his mind. He was trying to change his mind, yeah. but he didn't understand what was going on. Yeah, like, yeah. The whole he, time he's just saying, don't go, and he's just like, he doesn't understand why his why the patient wants to go so badly. He just thinks he's being difficult. Yeah, or he's been a rat. He's being a traitor, and he's not... He's not respecting his creed mm. in the sense of being a ma- part of the mafia. But, yeah, and that I think that was the other thing that really struck me. It's like the threats were not coming from the typical kind of life or death um, stakes that usually occur, although they are there. It came from just having the brother realise that fact and come to terms with it. Although using the language of plausible deniability, yeah. as you say, is such so effective, so, and that's what makes the story so touching, is how it kind of deals with these things, not by looking at you straight on and shouting it. It kind of gives you a sideways glance at it and says, these things are really difficult, and sometimes you can't really directly prosecute those issues you have to kind of look to the side yeah which is Um, very realistic to how people actually confront issues yeah and just accept it and it's not like look to the side with disgust it's like look to the side and say yeah this is really really complicated this is not something that can be easily resolved by just looking someone in the eye and saying, okay, it's like life doesn't work that way. And so that's why I think it was a great episode. It just did that so well. And David Foster and the other guy, what was his (laughs) name? John McAlwicky? Mankiewicz. There you go. Uh, They did it so well. And... Props to John for being on that one. He also did sports medicine. <laughs> well, I tell you what, he had the same idea, he had the right idea of mysteries and lies. He just needed the more talented David Foster. <laughs> more talented? That's quite a statement. My God. I know. Um, I hope he'll forgive me. Well, thank not. you very much for joining us on the latest episode of Differential Diagnosis. Uh, next week we'll be talking about the next episode of House <laughs> MD in the series, which I can't remember the name of. Uh, heavy. Heavy. About the overweight uh, girl who has a heart attack and there's more Vogler. Ooh. So um, be ready to join us for then. Um, until then, uh, thank you very much for watching, We uh, listening. We, we hope you enjoyed this. Um, uh, yeah, like, th- thank you so much for, for listening. And if you could give us a, a rating um, or a review wherever you can, that would be very helpful for us. And of course, um, if you want like a notification <laughs> for when the latest episodes are out, you can always follow us on Facebook or Twitter, uh, which is just at HouseMDCast or just search Differential Diagnosis Twitter or Facebook and it will come up. Um, but yeah, uh, unless Gaz has anything else to add, then, uh, yeah, I just want to, uh, once again, thank everyone for listening and we hope to see you next week. So it's goodbye from me. Um, and like, comment and subscribe, rate, don't rate, up to you, whatever you feel. Hey, oh, it's not like we're going to come around and put a horse's head in your bed. See you next time.